Okay. We've been talking a lot about this management level of performance measures at the, at the work process level, what we actually do in daily management. So we're talking about cost, but we haven't done that yet, have we? Hmm. So we've talked about quality, we've talked about time. So let's now focus on this cost issue. Now when we think about cost, there are a couple of things we need to talk about. First, we'll talk about the mythical cost quality trade-off. What is that about? Then we'll talk about transaction costs, what happens as products flow through processes. We'll talk about the elements of cost. Then we'll talk about the difference between hard and soft savings. Then how do we leverage savings from improvement projects? Okay, ready to go? So many of you have had probably classes in operations management. And what you've seen probably is a set of curves that look something like this. And we see that as quality is improving or defects are decreasing, that the cost of control is increasing. Now, question for you. What are those curves? How were they created? When was this relationship first observed? So what we see is, if we follow this normally, at the point where the two curves cross in the middle, that's the point of diminishing economic returns, at which point in time we have either underquality or overquality conditions. In other words, at some point in time, according to this function, it would say quality costs too much. At the other side, we see that we actually haven't spent enough money and we have less quality than would be desirable. Well, what were the functions? Well, this is an interesting question because underquality cheats the customer, overquality cheats your shareholders. So how are the functions calculated? Well, the model was originally done in the 1950s. And here, quality control occurred to a large measure by having an inspection process. So the mathematical function we see for eliminating defects was occurred by adding additional inspectors. So this is the combined efficiency of adding one more inspector to the process. And so it's one minus the failure rate that that inspector is able to add. So what we start seeing is, wait a minute, can you add more inspectors in your processes today? We're trying to eliminate headcount, not increase headcount. So we can't accept in uh, inspect in quality. What we have to do is we have to build quality into the process. So the defect rate is by the effect of adding additional inspectors. What's the cost? That's the budget that we have to have to pay for those inspectors. So quality cost does increase, yes, if we're adding more inspectors. But if we think about a process, what are we actually doing to increase the cost of quality? What we should be doing is removing waste, removing lost, improving the efficiency of the process, and in doing that, we are actually reducing the cost of the process. So it's a very expensive solution to add inspectors, and it's no longer approved. So why are we using that model to reflect what's actually happening? Well, the reason is we've had some assumptions that are baked into our whole analysis of quality and cost. One of those assumptions is that as long as it's between the upper and lower limits, it's good, but outside that, immediately, it's bad. And this assumption has a very simplistic goalpost mentality, just like when you're playing football. Ball within the goalpost and it hits the net, it's a goal. Outside, it's bad. But that's not really the way that quality works. The logical assumption in that model is nominal is best. We have to get it right on target and hold it there. But we see that there are other types of performance measures where nominal is best is not an optimal condition. For instance, do you want to have average cycle time or do you want to reduce cycle time? Do you want to have long uh, effects in terms of uh, uh, revenue or short revenue? Long profit, short profit, high productivity, low productivity. These measures all have a desired state which is not nominal as best. And so what we see is we need to understand what's actually the right performance that we want to achieve for process. Now, another observation we can make is that when we start taking a look at processes, what we see is at the end of most production facilities or operations facilities, we see a defect level that's somewhere between five to 7%. Now, what means is that this whole blue line that we see in this histogram, that was the process operating right. The red part is the process operating wrong. So when the process is operating right, what we have is actually we have minimal costs for throughput. That's the way we designed it. 
for that 5 to 7% where the process is operating wrong, we actually have a disproportionate amount of cost. Because now we have to expedite, we have to change things, we have to rework things, we have to sort things. And all of that costs money much more than the original design of the process. So a 5 to 7% defect rate can indeed create 20 to 40% extra cost in our process. As we're looking at that, what we see is to measure the cost of quality, we have to understand it in much better detail. Now there's a problem. Standard cost accounting suffers from a lot of bookkeeping problems. It doesn't actually tell us the cost of all the things that go into the process. It will give us scrap, rework, rejects, maintenance and service, warranty claims, materials obsolescence, and additional labor hours. But if we look into, the, into each of those a little bit, for instance, additional labor hours, was that because we were sorting? Or because we had so much more production, we decided to work extra hours to increase the productivity? So the codes don't immediately tell you what's exactly happening there. Were all of the warranty claims really a warranty claim? Or was a sales organization trying to build up goodwill with a customer and giving them a special benefit, if you will, a hidden discount on sales? So those are above the tip of the iceberg. Below the tip of the iceberg, we see our accounting systems don't tell us a lot of information we should. What's the opportunity cost if we could sell more but we're restricted because we don't have the productivity? What's the cost of process control? What's the cost of excess inventory, expediting, quality engineering? What's the cost to our customer? What's the cost in our supply chain? So as we're taking a look at these things, one thing is very clear that cost is not a very good discriminant in terms of should we actually take action or not. And in particularly, standard costs that are given to us by the finance organization. So what we really want to do is we want to understand transaction costs. And to do that, we look inside the process and we see, okay, in this one step of the process, how long did the process actually work? How much time did we spend in each step? What are the costs accumulated with those steps? And we create what's called an activity-based transaction cost. Those sorts of things, typically, once we have the performance measures for the process, we understand how long it's been there, what the rate of throughput is, and the cost components for each of those subsidiary parts of that process in terms of the materials, the equipment, the manpower or overhead related to that manpower, all of those things we can accumulate and then create that cost. Now, at a green belt level, you're not expected to be able to do that, but you should be able to work with a black belt and the finance organization to get a good cost estimate. For most Six Sigma projects at a green belt level, a rough magnitude of cost is sufficient to be able to say if the savings were warranted. So remember, standard cost accounting just provides us the tip of the iceberg. To get more understanding, we have to understand what's actually happening below that. Now, there's two types of benefits we can have. We can have hard benefits or we can have soft benefits. So hard benefits are those benefits that can be captured directly in the accounting records. So we eliminate overtime work. We re reduce the assets we have. We increase saleable output of the products. We reduce energy consulting or contractor costs. We have a reduction in employee overtime. All of those are hard benefits. Soft benefits are things like we have to eliminate activities, but we don't really reduce cost because nobody is actually moving out. We're not changing the cost basis, but we've made work easier to perform. Maybe we're going to have future costs eliminated or investment avoided, but cost avoidance does not count as a hard benefit. It's a soft benefit. And then there are times when we do things for either legal reasons improve customer satisfaction or employee satisfaction, and we can't necessarily calculate or allocate financial savings to those things, but we know that they're really good to do from a responsibility perspective for the organization. So all of those things are soft benefits. And so as we're starting to take a look, we start seeing there are a number of different classes of benefits. So as we're reducing the cost, we have to make sure that we are actually doing a combination of both, and we're accounting properly for hard benefits as compared to soft benefits. We shouldn't mix the two, because soft benefits management will never see in the accounting records. And if they don't see them in the accounting records and we've claimed them, then we lose our credibility as an improvement specialist. 
because they say, you said we're going to save 5 million and we only saved 200,000. What happened? Okay. And it's hard to explain. It's the management accounting system that's not telling us exactly what's going on. Now, there is one thing we can do as an engineer, and that is we can leverage out the return on a project. For instance, what we see is if I go and I take a look at one production line and I fix it and I, hey, let's just say I save 50,000 euros. However, if there are 10 production lines that have the same fault, if I take that savings and go to each of those production lines and implement a change, the savings benefit could be 500,000 euros. So we have to be very smart. How many places can we take the lesson that we've learned and create this type of benefit for the benefit of the organization that actually multiplies the effect of an individual project. It's best if we can do that at the very beginning. Now, in Six Sigma, we only calculate one-year savings, okay? Because after that, what we want is those benefits to be accumulated in the standard work process. And so we're going to treat this no longer as an improvement project after that first year. It now goes into standard work. And this means that we have to be attentive to taking a look and saying, what will be the next project we can do to drive the next increment of benefits? Now, we'll find at some point in time, we can't work on internal economics any longer. And what we see is we have to change the system's viewpoint. So maybe we go to supplier economics, or we go to the customer economics, and we start taking a look at this total value chain and understand how can we actually get waste from internal and external sources of cost. At this level, you probably are getting ready to move up to a black belt level of contribution to the organization. So as we've got our internal straightened out, which we can do as a green belt, we start seeing now we have to get ready to go outside the organization one way or the other. And that will be one of your next challenges as we start taking a look at this. So we have one more module to deal with. And in that module, we're going to talk about how do we transition from the analysis structure into the idea of conducting the improved phase.